This is part 4 of my talk about how to process Arenagram. In part 1 I gave an introduction and explained what the Arenagram is and in part 2 I talked about the importance of background subtraction and described uh, how we can recognize when background has been subtracted correctly. In part 3 I showed some examples of different background subtraction methods and now in part 4 I'm going to discuss the regions of interest that we need to draw in particular the kidney and bladder regions and background regions. Now the kidney regions must obviously include all of each kidney and that includes the renal pelvis. That's because the renogram curve is intended not just to show uptake of radiopharmaceutical into the kidney but also its elimination on into the bladder. And the renal pelvis forms part of the collecting system for urine in the kidney and so in most cases we're interested in how long it takes for radiopharmaceutical to pass through the whole of the kidney including that renal pelvis. Now if we look at an early image here we've got a sum frame 0 to 5 minutes we can see the radiopharmaceutical in the parenchyma the functioning tissues of the kidney. So we can easily draw a region of interest here in blue around the left kidney and in red around the right kidney. But if we look at a later frame, here we've got 25 to 30 minutes, we see that urine has now moved on into the renal pelvis and in the left kidney the pelvis is quite dilated and it's extended medially out of the original region that we drew. So we have to edit that region to extend it a bit in order to make sure that it includes all of the renal pelvis. It's then a very good idea to check that on a dynamic display. Here we've got a continuous cine display of all the frames from the renogram with the regions of interest superimposed so that we can check that the kidneys remain within that region of interest um, all the time. The regions don't need to be very precise. They don't need to be uh, nice uh, smooth curves like the ones I drew before. They can be um, a series of straight lines so as long as it includes all of the kidney we don't need to stick tightly to the kidney boundaries. Uh, in fact bigger is better than smaller. Um, if the region is too small that's obviously uh, no good because if we leave out some of the kidney within the region we will underestimate the true function. But if the region is bigger than the kidney as long as it includes all of the kidney it will be uh, possible to accommodate small movements if the patient doesn't keep perfectly still during the study. And a big region, the only disadvantage is that it will include a little bit extra background, but if we subtract background later on, that doesn't matter. In fact, the regions can be any shape. If all your computer can do is rectangular or elliptical regions, then that's fine as long as it includes all of the kidney. For some applications, you were asked to define parenchymal regions. Uh, this is needed if you want to calculate parenchymal transit time. In this case the regions must exclude all the collecting system, the major calyces and the renal pelvis because we're just interested in the parenchyma, the functioning tissues. This is quite difficult to do because the kidney is actually a three-dimensional organ and all we've got here is a two-dimensional projection and the parenchyma really wraps around the pelvis in three dimensions. So all we can do is draw some little C-shaped regions around the outer borders of the kidney as shown here uh, to try and avoid all the accumulation in the renal pelvis and just get bits of parenchyma. But because this is only covering part of the parenchyma, not all of it, you can't use these regions for relative function calculation because they will underestimate uptake because they don't include all of the parenchyma. The bladder region is easiest to draw on a late image because then that's when the bladder will be at its fullest. And once again, it's a good idea to check that on a dynamic display to make sure it stays within its region. However, uh, you don't need to include all of the bladder within the region uh, because it's not used for quantification. It's only used for generating a representative curve. So if not all of the bladder is in the field of view of the gamma camera, it doesn't matter if you miss a bit off. Background regions can be drawn in several ways. They can be drawn manually, either a single region that's got to apply to both kidneys or one background region for each kidney. They can be drawn automatically, either below, above or around the kidney 
and the other methods that I mention are the Rutland plot and deconvolution. So for Renogram background, you have to realize that we need to subtract two components of background from the kidney curves, um, as I explained in part two of this talk. So the first part is the tissue background, and that comes from tissues overlying the kidney, between the kidney and the gamma camera in the patient's back. And in those tissues, the activity rises over the first few minutes. Uh, and that's probably the same for left and right kidneys, because the tissues in the patient's back are the same for both kidneys. So any region close to the kidneys will be OK for that. The second component is the vascular background, and that arises from blood mainly within the kidney. Now, the activity in the blood starts high and falls over the first few minutes, as I explained in part two. And that may be different for each kidney because the amount of blood in each kidney may well be different. That's particularly true for a kidney with hydronephrosis because that has a large dilated pelvis with hardly any blood in it. So for its size, a hydronephrotic kidney will have less blood in it than a normal kidney of the same size. So you need to deal with the vascular component very carefully. On the other hand, it's much easier for the bladder because we only need to subtract tissue background. There is no blood background in the bladder to subtract. Now, if we compare that with DMSA scan background subtraction, um, the technetium DMSA scan background subtraction is much easier than the renogram background subtraction. If we look um, at this curve, this is uh, something that I showed in part two. I've got activity time curves here after injection of technetium 99M MAG3. And the red curve is from a region of interest above the kidney, which has got a lot of blood in it. And that gives a curve that starts high and then falls. On the other hand, the turquoise region underneath the kidney has not got very much blood. That's mostly tissue. That starts much lower, rises for a bit, and then falls more gently. Now, if we are doing background subtraction in a DMSA scan, that is an image taken two hours after injection. So there's been plenty of time for the tracer to reach an equilibrium between blood and tissue. So the distinction between the two background components, the blood and the tissue, doesn't matter. The tracer has had time to reach equilibrium by diffusing from blood into tissue. In fact, if you look at the two curves here, even by 20 minutes after MAG3 injection, it's reached an equilibrium so that the two curves above and below the kidney are hardly any different. So for a DMSA scan, if we were imaging long after injection, any background near to the kidneys works OK but it makes a big difference in the first few minutes. You can see here that background subtraction after MAG3, during the first five minutes, it makes a big difference whether we take the region above or below the kidney because the blood and tissue are very different. That's why background subtraction for a DMSA scan is much easier and for a renogram it's very hard. So how do you know when we've got it right? Well in part two I explained my criteria that a correctly subtracted renogram curve will rise smoothly from the origin. In other words, the first phase, the vascular phase of the renogram has been removed. However, some researchers will validate their particular background subtraction method using patients who've had a nephrectomy. Um, now, obviously, if the patient's had a nephrectomy, you should get zero uptake for that kidney because there's no kidney there. However, that's not a very good test because removing the kidney also removes the major source of that vascular background, the blood within the kidney itself. So a method that works for a nephrectomy doesn't necessarily work for a perfused kidney because you've made life easy. When you take out the kidney, you take out the major component of blood background. So getting the right answer for a nephrectomy merely proves that you can do tissue background subtraction properly. It doesn't prove that you have taken off blood background correctly because there wasn't any nephrectomy side. So I'm afraid you have to rely on my criteria that the correctly subtracted curve will rise smoothly from the origin. That, as far as I'm aware, is the only way to test that you have done vascular background subtraction properly. So when drawing background regions, 
one must always avoid the kidneys, ureters and bladder because we don't want those in, included in the background. In fact, if you're using MAG3, you should also try to avoid the liver because there are impurities in MAG3 which can sometimes be excreted through the liver. That doesn't apply to DTPA or I123 Hippuran. But we must also make sure we keep inside the body outline because we want to be drawing the background within the patient tissues, not within the air that's outside the patient. But with those restrictions, we can draw regions of interest representing background below the kidney. But these regions don't have enough blood compared with the kidney, and therefore they will tend to undistract, as I showed in part three of this talk. We can draw regions above the kidney, uh, but these will have too much blood compared with the kidney, and so those tend to over-subtract. Note, if we're using MAG3, we should put the uh, region above the left kidney and avoid the right kidney because of the liver. But for DTPA or Hippuran, we can put it above either kidney. You can, of course, draw a compromise somewhere above and between the kidneys, and this can get the right answer by trial and error. If the region you've chosen doesn't give correct subtraction, judged by the fact that the Renogram curve after subtraction rises from zero, then if you've over-subtracted, you can reduce the amount of blood in the background region by bringing it down a bit, or if you've under-subtracted, you can increase the amount of blood in the background region by taking it up a bit above the, the kidney. But that sort of trial and error can be very tedious. Many guidelines suggest using a perirenal background region, like these C-shaped ones around the kidneys. This gives a fixed mixture of blood and tissue, uh, but the right kidney background may include liver, which is not good with MAG3. And it's not always right, particularly for hydronephrotic kidneys, as I showed in one of the examples in part three of this talk. The Rutland method, which I mentioned in part three, uses a mixture of blood and tissue, which can be optimized for each kidney. And I find that to be the most reliable method. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. So if we're just performing simple background subtraction, we have a kidney region and a background region. But we assume that the tissues in the background region of interest are similar to the tissues overlying the kidney. Uh, that's a reasonable assumption because the tissues overlying the kidney will be muscles in the patient's back. And those are similar tissues to what will be in the background region if we draw it anywhere near to the kidney. So in that case, we assume that the counts in each pixel in the background region of interest will be the same as the background counts in each pixel in the kidney region of interest. Therefore, for each point in the curves, the computer analysis program will calculate the average counts per pixel in the background region of interest by taking the background counts and dividing by the size of the background region in pixel to give the counts per pixel. Then if you multiply by the size of the kidney region in pixel, that will give you the estimated background counts that are in that kidney region of interest. If you subtract that from the actual counts in the kidney region of interest, that will give the background subtracted kidney counts. And if you do that for every point in the curves, you get the background subtracted kidney curve. Now that works well for tissue background, um, because the tissue background per pixel is representative of what's in the kidney. But it doesn't work well for the intrarenal blood background because the amount of blood in the kidney region will not be the same per pixel as the amount in the background region depending on where you take your background. Now background subtraction is based on the average counts per pixel, as I've just explained. So actually, the size of the background region doesn't matter in that calculation. It gets normalized out. However, you shouldn't make the background region too small, because a small background region will lead to low counts, and low counts lead to a large error. That's because 
fluctuations due to the random nature of radioactivity uh, cause fluctuations in the counts in each region quite naturally and we can't avoid this. In fact, the random nature of radioactivity leads to a Poisson distribution, so we call this Poisson noise. And for a Poisson distribution, the uncertainty is defined to be the square root of the counts. So, for example, if our background is 100 counts in each pixel, then if we take a very small background region of just 4 pixels, this will be a very extreme case, then 100 pixels would have 400 counts. But that would be plus or minus 20, because the square root of the 400 counts is 20, so we have an uncertainty of 20 counts on that 400 due to random Poisson noise. So if we got 400 plus or minus 20 counts in 4 pixels, in each pixel it will be 100 plus or minus 5 counts, and that's our estimate of the counts per pixel in this small background region. However, if we take a bigger background region, say 100 pixels, now at 100 counts per pixel that will be 10,000 counts. But that's subject to this random uncertainty due to Poisson noise equal to the square root of 10,000, which is 100. So it's 10,000 plus or minus 100 counts in 100 pixels, which means in each pixel it's 100 plus or minus 1 count. So we've got the same average counts of 100 counts per pixel, but we've reduced our uncertainty from plus or minus 5 to plus or minus 1 by taking a bigger region. That's why it's good to take as large a region as you can for backgrounds to minimize the uncertainty due to Poisson noise. Ideally, the background region should be similar size in uh, to the kidney region, if you can manage it. Um, it doesn't have to be exactly the same size, of course. Um, something between one-third and two-thirds of the kidney size is usually quite reasonable. So, that's the end of part four of this talk. In part five, I go on to explain the recommended background subtraction methods.